All right, let's start off with lab number one. Okay, we're ready to go here. Um, over the semester, I'll probably, I think my plan is to make these kind of walkthroughs of the labs, even though we'll be having a similar walkthrough during class. We may decide to do some kind of flipped classroom where I do a walkthrough like this, and then we use the class time for debugging and other kinds of uh, back and forth conversation. I will just see how it goes over the semester. Okay, so we're in lab one basics. I'm going to assume that you've followed through and figured out how to install R in RStudio and how to get a github.com account and download GitHub desktop and test the pipeline. We're gonna go over all that stuff on Thursday in case it didn't uh, work out. Here's our first lab. Now, uh, this is associated with the reading from Vokey and Allen from chapter one. And that's this textbook right here. And if we go down and check out chapter one, where is it? We see a, an example from uh, Carl Frederick Gauss, where he's asked to add up the numbers one to 100. And he did it really fast. He just basically, he thought that he could imagine the numbers going from one to 100, and he could imagine another number line going from 100 to one. And he sort of realized that if you line these numbers up and you add down, one plus 100 is 101, two plus 99 is 101, three plus 98 is 101. This is, they all add up to 101. So you basically have 100, 100 and ones. And if you were to uh, add up all of that and divide by two, you'd get 5,050, which is the answer. And then the rest of the chapter talks about um, finding the sum of any constant series or sequence of numbers. All right, and then we see some, some discussion on that and a formula for how to do it. And finally, an example of how to do this in a spreadsheet. So lab one for us using R is all around this problem. We're going to figure out how to do this in R. It's pretty quick. And then we're gonna use this example to discuss some basic features, some fundamental aspects of programming in R. Now, you can read all of this on the website. Here it is. I'm going to switch over to R Studio because I wrote all of this in R itself. And what I wanna do in terms of going over the lab is I need to switch this over to Psych 7709 lab. And let's find the lab, here it is. And it's not in the viewer yet. So this is the source code for the lab. If I knit this over here, I can bring it up and we can look at it this way. So on the right hand side, I'll be looking to talk about some of the things you could see on the website. And then over here, which is the actual R Markdown document, I'll be using this to demonstrate some of the R commands. Okay, so let's look over here. Our first problem is how do we sum up the numbers one to 100? Well, in the story, there was a bunch of kids in a school room and most of the kids were sitting there thinking like one plus two is three and three plus three is six and six plus four is 10 and 10 plus five is 15 and kind of working it out that way, take a while. Gauss apparently just sat there and went, wham, 5,050, wow, amazing. Well, you know, with R, you could do that too because in order to solve this problem in R, all you need to do is run this code. Sum parentheses one colon 100 and you get 5,050. So over here we can see the code and we can see the output. Uh, when we're looking in this window, this is what the raw R Markdown document looks like. I've got the code right here. So I could actually press play and it will put the output up here. Or, and really what happens when you press play uh, is this one line of code or any line of code inside the chunk 
that's copied into the console. So every time I press play, this happens. So you should see this. Every time I press play, it just keeps happening. There we go. All right. The point is, it's pretty fast to sum up some numbers from 1 to 100. And in fact, we could sum up numbers from any number to any, num any number pretty easily in R. This would do 5 to 10. This would do 100 to 200. We just need to change these numbers. So if I went sum and then 3 to 100, you know, whatever numbers I want to change. So we can find the sum of uh, lots of different sequences of numbers this way. There's many details going on behind the scenes here, uh, and we're going to dive into some of those details to understand how this sum function works. Uh, we're going to look at how to actually generate sequences of numbers so that we can add them up. And then we're going to look at making functions like the sum function to take actions or to actually process some numbers that we generated. So let's talk about some R basics for background. How can we create sequences of numbers in R? Here's a really easy way, and it's related to what we saw inside the sum function. So inside the sum function, we just had a number followed by a colon followed by another number. And you can see that uh, I'm showing you some examples here where 1 colon 5 produces 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1 colon 10 produces 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So 1 colon 10, you can see that this is happening here. Um, yeah, you could put any number you want, 5 colon negative 5. Maybe it's going to go for 5 down to negative 5, or you could go negative 10 to, I mean, 1,000. Wow, you get a lot of numbers. Uh, so this is a really fast way to make sequences of numbers that go up by 1 or down by 1 in R. Good to know. How does that happen? Well, there's another function. Um, well, actually, let me back up and say, you'll, you'll find that there's many ways to do the same thing in R oftentimes. So this is one way. Another way is called the SEQ, or seek function, short for sequence. Let's check that one out. Uh, this is the second function we've seen. We saw the sum function before, and now we're looking at the seek function. Any time you want to learn about a function in R, you can try looking at the help file. To find the help file, you just need to type in question mark, followed by the name of this of the function. So in this case, seq, press enter. And that will load up the help file. And help files sometimes are helpful, sometimes they're hard to read. This is supposed to give us examples of how to use the function. This tells us about arguments that we provide inside the function. And this tells us about some details. <laughs> and at the bottom, if you scroll down, you can usually see some examples that you can just, for these examples, you can just grab them, copy them, put them into the terminal and press enter and try to work out what's going on. So we're going to step through this seek function. And what we're going to learn, we're going to look through some examples. We're going to learn that this function takes some inputs. Here's an example. Uh, the input is from some number to some other number. So it says that right here, or the from and the to. These are inputs. They're separated by a comma. So see how we write this out here? Uh, and I press enter already, but we write seek parentheses, the first input parameter from equals and the number, and the second input parameter two equals a five. And we can go from one to 10, or from one to 100, or whatever we want. And that's what's nice about this function. I'll also mention that uh, we don't actually need to write the names from equals and to equals if we don't want to. We could just go, well, we've got the example here, seek uh, one comma five. That will work, and it goes one to five. So it's basically, this is the same as going like this, right? I'll give you a hint. Uh, we'll see it down here. It's actually the same as going like this. So here's three different ways to do the exact same thing. 
the sequence function has a few more bells and whistles. So it's got this extra parameter that you could use if you wanted to. It's called the by parameter. This is like a step size. So let's check that out. If we go here, we can go from one to five in steps of one. Or if we could, what happens if we go from one to five in steps of two? Well, it's gonna go one, three, five. What if we wanna go from one to five in steps of four? Let's just go one, five. We can go to one to 50 in steps of four. Uh, so you can control uh, the step size. And the step size doesn't have to be an integer. In this example, I note in this example, I didn't even use the words from, to, or by, I just put the numbers because uh, these, ref these are in the position uh, in the default position. So this is the from number, this is the to number, and this is the by number. We're gonna go from one to five in steps of 0.5. Now we get these intermediate values. Okay. Um, so we've got this seek function that we could use to generate all sorts of different kinds of sequences. And if we wanted to go back to the chapter when we're talking about not only summing up the values, uh, where are they, that go from one to 100, but summing any constant series, well, um, we could do that in R pretty easily because now we can make any constant series using the seek function. So if we wanted to sum any constant series in R, we could do it this way. We could create some constant series. So this one is the seek going from 100 to 200 in steps of five. I'm just copied out just that part, pasted in there. So we got this sequence. Now I've pasted this sequence, basically, sorry, I've, pl I've placed it inside of the sum function. So when we do this uh, or press play, we compute the sum of that sequence. Let's go down to catch up here. So this is a very fast way in R to produce any constant series from any starting value to any ending value with any step size, and then to simply sum those values. Uh, in the chapter, we saw that there is a analytical formula, a general formula, here it is, that allows you to compute the sum of any constant series if you know the starting value x1, the ending value xn, and c standing for the step size. If you plugged all those values into this formula, you could compute the answer. And I just wanna show you that a uh, quick example. In R, let's just line this up here. Actually, I'm gonna show you, just highlight two things for you. Um, so I wrote this lab uh, in R Markdown right here. And this part is a LaTeX notation that allows you to print out math into a document. So this is really quite nice. Just wanted to point that out. Uh, we'll be learning more about these kinds of things probably in semester two of this course. The point now is that we can implement these kinds of equations in R pretty, pretty easily. And here's an example. So I've created a variable called x1, and I've created a variable called xn, and a variable called step. And these are referring to the x1, xn, and c. I've assigned a 100 to x1. When I do this, one line, whoops, I create a new variable called x1 in the environment and it contains a 100. This middle thing is called the assignment operator. It's a less than sign followed by a dash. If I wanted to assign the next thing, I would say the name of it, xn, which is something I've come up with myself. 
the assignment operator, and a 200. What we're doing is we're saying assign the value or assign a 200 into this thing xn. Now we have one 100 and x1 have 200 and xn. By the way, if you type the name of a variable stored in the global environment into the console and press enter, it will print out the contents so you can look at it. So finally, we're making a step variable. So now we've got these three things. And notice these numbers correspond to the example right here, a starting value of 100, an ending value of 200, and a step size of 5. Finally, to implement this formula, uh, this is what it looks like in R. Now, if we were to run this, we'll just compute the answer, 3,150. I'm going to rewrite this just to walk through the process of translating a formula like this one here into R. So I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to do the xn minus x1. So I'm going to do xn minus x1. There we go. And we want to divide that by C. We've, our version of C is called step. So we use, use the slash for divide. Now, in this case, uh, because of operator precedence, what's going to happen is x1 is going to be divided by a step. What we want to have happen is both of these things, we first want to compute the difference and then divide. So we use the parentheses to make sure this happens and then this happens. All right. So the next thing we want to do is take all of this and add a 1. Now again, this is going to add a 1 to step and not to this whole thing. So that's why we need to add another set of parentheses, just like this. And sometimes it can be useful to add some spaces just to see. I didn't do that up here, but here we can and it makes it a little bit easier to see. All right, now we want to take all of this and multiply it by something over here. So I'm going to take all of this and in order to create that, I've made another set of parentheses. And this, admittedly, it does start getting hard to track if you have an extra parentheses on one side or the other. But you can see that our Studio tries to help you out. So when you go to this parentheses, it highlights the one that it's paired up with. When you go to this one, it highlights the one it's paired up with and so on. So the next thing we need to do is do a multiplication symbol. And then I'm going to anticipate that I need some parentheses for the x1 plus xn. And we can divide that by two. This should probably work, but I'm just gonna be extra careful and add these additional parentheses. And if we wanted to space them out, we could do that too. So again, that does, that works. Okay, so that's just a quick example of um, walking through writing out math, re relatively simple math formulas in R. So we're kind of treating are like a calculator this way. All right. So what we have next is some discussion of some basic building blocks of R. Um, we're going to talk about vectors first. And if you recall, uh, Gauss did a trick where in order to add up the numbers from 1 to 100, he imagined two number lines, one going from 1 to 100, and the other one going from 100 to 1. And he noted that if you sum the 1 and the 100 and the 2 and the 99 and the 3 and the 98, they all add up to 101. And let's see if we can demonstrate this in R. So we could make a number line from 1 to 100 this way, right? And we could make a number line from 100 to 1 going this way. And can we just add them up? It turns out we can. All we have to do is something like this. 
it, it's almost like what you would it's what you would think you, this this one plus that one and what happens is they get added up uh, and you get a hundred and ones everywhere so if you wanted to kind of do Gauss the the mental tricks that Gauss was doing you 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 could basically I mean this is kind of silly of course we can just add up all the numbers from one to one hundred just like this but what Gauss was doing in his head was something like this adding up uh, well actually who knows what he was doing in his head maybe he was going like oh there's a hundred times a hundred and one fine and there's ten thousand one hundred total and there's two number lines so I need to divide by two that's how I get my five thousand fifty in any case my point is uh, to get us thinking a little bit more about what what's going on in R when we do this 1 to 100 or 100 to 1 and these kinds of things. Well, what we're doing is we're creating what's called a numeric vector in R. All right? And we've every time we've done like 1 to 5, 1 to 100, we're creating what's called a vector. Vectors can be given names so that we can save them up here uh, or in our memory just like we did with these individual variables. So if we run this line and press play, we've, we're assigning the vector 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 into something named A. And we can see it right here. So I type A. I'm going to retrieve from memory its contents, and its contents is a vector with these five numbers in it. Uh, anytime you want to remove something from your memory for the current R session, you can always type RM and then the name of a variable. So I said RMA, and it's going to remove that variable. You can remove all the variables by going to session, clear workspace, and then removing them like that. Vectors uh, have and other kinds of variables in R, as we'll learn, have something called class. That is the kind of information stored in the variable. If we do an A and make it 1 to 10, we can see the word int here. That's talking about its class. And if we asked R what the class of A is, this way, we'll see that it has an integer class. So it's Uh, this refers to the fact that all of the numbers in our vector are integers. There's no decimals. If we made something called B and made it a sequence going from 1 to 2 in steps of 0.25, we now have decimals in here. As we, if we ask for the class of this one, then we get numeric, which uh, refers to decimal values. All right, it's possible to make all sorts of vectors in R, and they don't need to be numbers, they could be letters. The general concept of a vector is really just a storage container. We've kind of got a set of slots, uh, so this whole thing, you might call it a vector, just a place in memory where you can put things into it. And it could be numbers, it could be letters, or what have you. Uh, actually, I shouldn't have done this. We'll see later on that R likes to store uh, information in vectors such that everything in the vector has the same class. So mixing different classes doesn't really work in R. But we'll get there in a moment. What I want to talk about now is a method for creating vectors using the C function. So there's a function in R, it's called C, and that's just one letter, and it's short for combining values. Um, I've got a little analogy here to help us think about how C works in terms of a train car, and I'll just, I'll just draw some train cars. So there, here's my terrible train, and these train cars aren't connected. If I wanted, so it's not a train. I'm, I'm going to say there's an analogy between a train and a vector. 
So right now we just have a bunch of train cars. We don't have a total train. In order to make a train, you need to like connect the cars together. You need to hook them up. And now we have a train, not just individual train cars. It's like this uh, with vectors. When we, we have these slots that can take things, like you could put something in here, you could put something in here. These could be like some train cars, train, three train cars together, two train cars together. Um, it'd be nice uh, if we could make these something to connect any set of cars together. So it could be just two, might connect them. Maybe there was already two that were connected and you have another one you want to connect. You can just go in there and start connecting pieces. Now that's what the combine function will do for you. So let's check it out. We're going to use it all the time and we're going to use it to make vectors. So here's an example of using the C function to create a vector that has some letters in it. The name of this is called letters and it has three letters, A, B, and C. So A is in the first position. I'm just gonna say, if we have a vector, this is position one, this is position two, this is position three, or slot one, two, three. And now this one has an A in it, and this one has a B in it, and this one has a C in it. Great. Uh, um, let's make one with numbers. So we did it. Now we've got some numbers, the numbers one, two, three in there. Notice the syntax is C parentheses, and then I'm just going to use a star, something, comma, something, comma, something, comma, something. And that's how we do it. We, and we end with the right parentheses, but we always separate our elements with a comma. Uh, here's an example of some class issues. So I want to point out that R will understand characters as a particular kind of class. So let's look at the class of letters. It's called a character class. Let's look at the class of numbers. It's a numeric class. And let's look at this one, numbers as cars. So what we've done here is we've put quotations around the numbers. And this will actually tell R to treat these as characters, not as numbers, all right? So if we were to look at this, the class of that variable, numbers as cars, we'll call, call it a character. Um, I'm just pointing this out. The class of a vector or of a variable is important. Um, here's a simple example. If you, you can do one plus one, right? That's gonna work but you can't do one plus a, right? You can't add a number to a character, it just doesn't make sense. Similarly, if you try to go one plus the character one with quotations, that won't work either. As you gain more experience with R, you may start creating variables that you assume are one kind of class, you assume, oh, these are numbers. They must be represented as numbers in R, but maybe they're represented as characters. It's possible, these kinds of things happen. And then uh, some of the computations you try down the line won't work. So it's important to recognize that the things you're storing in the slots in your vectors can have these different classes. In these three examples, I've just stored one character or one number and when it comes to characters, you, you can store groups of them or strings in a vector. So this is an example of storing five or six different things into a vector called words. And each of those things is a string and each string has a bunch of letters. So re really we can store lots of different things in a vector in R. And Every time we've done this, we've used the C command. And um, it's almost like we had these, this thing, this thing, this thing, and this thing. They're all four different things. But when we use the C command, we combine them, we glue them together. So now they're kind of connected in the vector afterwards. 
All right. So vectors are these groups of elements. They're like a train car. And like a train car, trains can be of different lengths. So this could be a really long train, right? And how long is this train? Well, you'd have to count out how many cars it has. This has one, two, three, four, five, six. So this has a length of six cars. Just like a train, a vector's length is how many elements it has. So let's take a look at letters. This one, you could see it goes one to three. It's got three things in it. So the length is a function in R. If we run it, we're going to return a three. You can see there's uh, three elements in there. If we run this on words, which has six things, uh, we'll see a six. And sometimes it's very useful to ask a question about a variable and ask how long it is, how many things are in it. Um, all right, moving on. I'm going to try to give you some intuitions about using C for combining because it's it's impressive what it can do. Uh, here's a quick example. Here, what we are doing is combining three separate three things, a one, a two, and a three. And um, we're putting right here a one colon five. Now one colon five, that's actually a one, two, three, four, five, isn't it? So this will produce a sequence that goes one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. Let's check it out. One, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. So in other words, we've added three individual elements in our combined statement, and then we also added a vector in there, and that's pretty neat. Uh, let's look at this one. So here, we're taking an existing variable called letters, that's up here, and it's a vector with three letters in it. And we're taking another vector called words, that's right here, and it's got six words in it. And we can combine this letters vector with this words vector. It's almost like you have a train car, you have a train with three cars already, you've got another train with six cars, and it's like, make a bigger train, put them together, right? And there you go. Let's look at the some characters. It's a vector and it's got ABC, then the words following it. So combine is very useful for putting elements together. And the way it does it is quite flexible because you can have individual elements and you can even have already grouped elements in there. It, I've alluded to this that uh, in R, in general, R requires that all of the elements in a vector have the same class. Um, let me point out that if I run this, so what I've done here, inside of this class function, I wrote the C function, which generates the sequence, the vector one, two, three, right? I've put that inside a class function. So we're now asking, what is the class of the vector one, two, three? and it comes back numeric. Well, we could do that here. What is the class of the vector ABC? Well, it's character. This one, we haven't talked about yet. Uh, we have a vector of true comma false comma true, and this is called a logical type, logical class. We'll use those for sure in this course. Let's take a look at this kind of combination. Uh, you'd you know, if, if, if you think about how trains work, you can have a train that has like passenger cars and tank cars and stock cars, and you can put them all together and make a big train with lots of different kinds of cars. In R, it's gonna basically try to avoid that. It's gonna make them all passenger cars or make them all tank cars. And a weird thing is it'll do that even if they, uh, it will either break and cause an error if it can't make a conversion, or it will try to convert one kind of car to another. So let's look at this one. Clearly, these are numbers. They're numeric type. These ones are letters. They are characters. So what happens if we try to combine some numbers with some characters? Well, it will work, but look what happens. It turns the numbers into characters. 
So they lose their number status. They've been converted into characters. This is something just to keep in mind as you work with information in R. All right, let's move on to indexing a vector. So we've talked about vectors as if they're a kind of train with individual cars and how we can um, create vectors of different lengths and connect cars together to create uh, different kinds of vectors storing different kinds of information. A uh, really important thing about vectors in general is being able to take a look and inspect individual parts of a vector, individual slots. So it would be like going and asking what's in this train car, what's in that train car? You know, if we imagine we've got some slots here, you want to go in here and ask the question, what is in there? And you might want to take a look and say, I want to change that. I want to like take this out. Maybe it's a, maybe it was a three and you're like, I don't want a three in there. I want to put a two in there. So you want to be able to go in and modify, manipulate these kinds of things. We can do that using indexing. To do indexing, you use the square bracket notation. Let's check that out here. So I'm going to create a vector called A. It's got these numbers 1, 6, 3, 2, 8, 9 in them. Now, if I type A, I get them all back. If I type A left square bracket, right square bracket, and inside of here, I type a number, 1, 2, 3, 4, referring to the location in the vector, I return back the number in that location. So the first number is a one. So what is the second number? It's a six. And the third number is a three. And the fourth number is a two. What's pretty cool is uh, you can do one at a time or any number at a time. So you could go one to two. That would get you the first two things, one to three. You could go, um, you know, actually you could go backwards. You go five to one. There's lots of things. Basically, you could put a vector inside of the square brackets that specifies these uh, location numbers, and it's going to return those to you. So we already know how to make a vector using combine. You could say, well, I want the first one and the fifth one. And you get the first thing and the fifth thing. What happens if you said, well, I want the first thing and the first thing and the first thing and the first thing? Well, that would be a vector of ones like this. Uh, did I say three or four ones? I don't know. So this one has a vector of four ones. So what's going to happen here? It's going to return the first thing four times. So we'll become more familiar with indexing in R. It's actually a very powerful way to locate particular things inside a vector and change them, manipulate them. It becomes very useful later on for data analysis. I mentioned it's possible to change the contents of a particular element in a vector. And uh, we could do that as an example here. Let's say we wanted to go in, change the first value, maybe make it 100. So we can do that just like this. We're assigning the value of 100 into the first slot of A. You can see we've changed it up here. You can see it's, there's 100 in the first position now. Um, just for fun, let's assign a 1 to the fifth and sixth position. So we could do it just like this. Uh, I'll run both these lines at the same time. So we've now changed the last two to 1s. All right, uh, we're going to talk about growing a vector sometimes. And this is a little bit related to what we've talked to talked about before. Um, but you'll find it useful, I'm sure, at some point to start off with basically nothing and then keep adding pieces as necessary. Uh, let's take a look at that. If we use the combine function, you don't put anything in it. It's like combining two train cars that don't exist or combining imaginary 
train cars that are uh, combining no train cars at all uh, to make no train, to make a null train. So if we run this line and take a look at A, it's, sorry, A, it says null. It's an empty vector. But it is nevertheless a named object of a vector type. So that means that we can potentially add to it. And there's more than one way to do that. Here's a, a kind of conceptually interesting way to do it. I would like to combine A, which is null, with another thing, a one. So what happens here? If we just run this part, just the right side, we get a one. This results in a one because A is nothing combined with one is a, a one. Well, if we assign this back into A, now A becomes a one. So what happens if we keep doing this kind of thing over and over? So we're going to keep assigning A plus a one into itself and then looking at it. So let's do this and then look at it. We get a one and a one. That's because at this point, A contained a one and we combined it with another one. We put it back into A. So now A has a one and a one. So at this point, A has a one, one. So when we go here and we, we know we can basically, I'm going to comment here. And this, this is like writing C, one one this is for the the a and then we're adding another one so it's kind of like writing this because this one already has two ones in it so we do that and look we'll get three ones i'll just scroll down just another way to see this it's we keep on adding a one to this vector so this is a way of growing the vector by combining a new thing onto the existing thing. It just appends to the back, keeps adding on. Uh, to visualize that process, we've started off with basically nothing, and then we added nothing to something, so we get a slot, and then we add a slot to that slot, and add a slot to that slot, and add a slot to that slot, and we just keep on going like this. In this case, we're putting ones into each of the slots and adding them every time we, we do this operation. Here's another way that it could work. This one might make a little bit more sense. You start off with an empty vector. So now A has nothing in it. But we want to assign something into the first slot of the vector, just like this. And we can do that. And it will work. So now A in position 1 has a 1 in it. Let's say we wanted to assign a one into position two of the variable of the vector. We could do that. So now a has a one in position one and a one in position two. Let's add another one. We could do it like that. We could just go all the way out and add a one into position ten. Let's try that. Now we get a bunch of what's called NAs, uh, referring basically to not a number. And that's because we haven't assigned anything into positions four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. We jumped right to 10. But these are some examples of kind of using the vectors. All right. Just to jump ahead here, we're down in problem three, and we're going to, or sorry, give an overview. We're going to talk about uh, writing a sum function what we've done up to now is talked about vectors, which are, I'm just going to go back and say, part of the very simple, uh, we're, we're trying to expose some of the underlying basis of being able to do something simple like this, sum equals uh, the sum of all the numbers from 1 to 100. We've talked about vectors because this is a way of producing something that can represent the values 1 to 100. So a vector could be 100 p slots long, and inside could have the numbers 1 to 100. 
we've seen an example of that here. And we've seen that vectors in R can actually represent other things besides numbers. But we haven't talked about how we do something like add up all the numbers. So how do we do the sum function? And this is the third problem. And to talk about this, we need to describe, to do an overview of algorithmic concepts using loops and writing functions. Um, maybe not at the end of this lab or this week, but certainly by the end of the semester, you'll become comfortable with writing your own functions in R. Here's an example of writing a custom function in R that does the job of computing a sum. I'm going to flip back into R Studio. Here's this function. We've seen that we can assign values into variables like we did up here. All of these um, variables have some things that have been assigned into them. We can also assign functions. So uh, if we run this piece of code, and go down, we'll see that a function appears in the global environment. Its name is my underscore sum. I wrote it right here. And we can use this function now. And I can I just tested it that the sum of the numbers 1 to 100 does equals uh, 5,000 to 50. So the goal of the, the last part of the lab is to talk about uh, how do we understand this particular custom function. And let's get into it. So we need to talk about algorithms. And basically an algorithm is a step-by-step -step recipe um, that if you follow the steps will result in a desired or particular outcome defined by the algorithm. So for example, what is the algorithm for adding up numbers? Say the numbers one to five. It might be something like this. You take the first number, right? And you add it to the second number. We've got numbers one, two, three, four, five. So we've got one plus two, we've got to do that, we've got a three. Then we have to take that and add it to the next number. So we've got a six. And we have to take that and we have to add it to the next number. So six plus four equals 10. So we take that, add it to the next number. 10 plus five equals 15. And one way of describing that is you take the first number and add it to the second. You take the sum and add it to the next number. And then you repeat step two until there's no more numbers in the series. And then you report the final sum. So that could be a way of verbally describing this algorithm. And we're saying that um, that's what this function from R does for us. And we could try to write this algorithm down kind of by hand. So we would need to create the numbers one to five. So we could do that right now using one colon five. And then we could say, okay, well, let's create a variable called the sum. And it's going to be the sum of the first two numbers. So the number in position one of A and the number in position two of A. So I can do that. And I can look at that value, it's a three. So we're kind of at this step right here. We've created this thing, we've called it the sum. And now what do we wanna do? Well, we wanna take the sum that we have and add it to the next number, which is in the position three of A. So we're gonna take all of this, which it's gonna add up to six. We, we wanna replace the uh, value of the sum with this new number. So we do that. And then we could look at that new value, which is the six. I'll just scroll down because this is all printed out right here. And you can see that as we do this, the value of this variable goes three, six, 10, 15, just like over here. And at the end, we get the correct answer, which is the sum of one to five, 15. Now, you could think of this whole piece of code as a, an algorithm that will always work. It will always 
produce the numbers one to five in sequence and it will always add them all up. And at the very end, it will produce the sum. So if I press this play button, it does all these things. And it does it every single time I press this play button. It has to, it's by definition going to do these things. So we've made an algorithm to compute the sum of these two numbers or of the, of the sequence of the numbers one to five. However, this isn't very general, is it? Uh, if we wanted to do the sequence one to 10, we'd have to by hand add more lines here. And so whenever we have to do that, we're always gonna look for ways to make R do that part for us to automate that part. And this is where loops can be very useful. A loop allows you to tell R to repeat something. So it'd be like, do this part and do this part over and we can loop through it. And let's talk about loops for a little bit. Uh, if you wanna check out all of the ways you can do loops, you can do question mark control, learn about control flow. I'm gonna go through loops just enough to introduce you to them. And this is something we'll come back to a lot throughout the rest of the course. And you'll also learn uh, there's alternative ways in R to accomplish the same kind of goals that loops accomplish for us. That is to do something over and over and over again. We can do it with a loop and later on we'll learn we could do it some other ways. But here's the basic idea. And here is also the basic syntax. Uh, we write it just like this. We, are, we write the word for and then a parentheses and left parentheses and there's something called an iterator. We write the word in and then a vector. And after that, we put a curly bracket followed by a curly bracket. And in between, we write our code that does stuff. So this is just an example of the structure of the syntax. So let's take a look at some loops that actually do stuff. So here's one and let's run it. I'm gonna press play and we see five, 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 five. So R has done something five times. In this loop, I is a variable and I could have um, called it anything I want. Uh, let's call it a, an L, it'll still work. Let's call it a K, it'll still work. It doesn't matter, this is a variable name. I'm just calling it an I. And um, we're kind of saying out loud for I in one to five. Now we already know what one colon five is, right? It actually is a vector, one, two, three, four, five. I'm gonna rewrite this so it looks a little bit easier to see. So we've got our I and then we've got in one, two, three, four, five. That's basically what's going on here. In the loop, uh, what's gonna happen, the loop is going to cycle. It's gonna go and start at the beginning and at the very beginning, it's gonna take this first thing and it's gonna put it into I. So the first go round of the loop, I will be one because it's the first thing over here. And um, once the loop stops, it goes, it starts again. And it will put the second thing into I. And then it will put the third thing and then the fourth thing and then the fifth thing. So how many times will this loop go around? It will go around one, two, three, four, five. It will do five things because there's five things in the vector. And so at each iteration, the, the value of I will actually change. It will be one, then two, then three, then four, then five. That's a kind of explanation of what's going on under the hood. However, here, uh, what we can see is, although I changes its value from one to five over the course of the loop and I does that change five times because there's five things, the, the actual content of the loop is, is right here. It's saying print five. Like we could say print 30 or print 
hello. Let's say print hello. If we do that, it's going to print hello five times because there's five uh, things in the loop. If we said 1 to 50, now there's going to be 50 cycles in the loop. And it's going to print hello 50 times. It's going to put it back to 5. All right. So this is give, meant to give you the idea that if you set up a for loop like this, you can make R do something over and over and over and over and over and over. Let's just, uh, so I told you before that as we go around the loop, the value of i changes. It actually becomes each of the successive values over here in the vector. We could verify for that, verify that for ourselves by printing i. Let's, if, if, if what I was saying is true, we should see one, two, three, four, five, because i changes its value on each step of the loop. And we do see that. OK. Um, this is just an example to show you that if you have a vector somewhere, like this one, you've, we've created a vector 1 to 5, and we've assigned it to a variable called my sequence. You can now write the loop like this for i in the name of a vector. And what's going to happen is the loop will go through each of the elements in the vector and assign those elements to i. So if we did this, we would see um, i is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 along each of the steps of the loop. It's important to remember that this i, or whatever you call this, this iterator, I mean, whatever variable name you give it, it becomes the next value in the vector. Uh, so if your vector, let's say, wasn't the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in that order, let's say it was these numbers, and they go 1, 5, 2, 3, 4, um, consider what's going on here. How many cycles will this loop have? It will have five, because there's five elements. But i will not be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, because it will be 1, 5, 2, 3, 4. It will be assigned the value in order in this vector. So let's just run the loop. Let me do it here. And 1, 5, 2, 3, 4. Also, the vector, the doesn't need to be numbers. It could be letters. And here, again, so this one has four elements, so there's going to be four cycles to this loop. And in each cycle, I will be assigned in the, uh, the whatever the element is. So it's going to be A, B, C, D. All right. Um, I'm briefly going to mention some things. We're going to go into them in more detail later. So. Here's something called an if-else statement. I'm just going to totally gloss over that and say that we can, if we're making R do a loop and just keep doing something over and over and over, sometimes we want to stop it. We want to break the loop. So this loop's going to go 10 cycles. It's going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way to 10. What if we wanted to print the value of i up to 5? but then stop it after that. Don't do that anymore. Stop the loop. So that's what we've done here. We've set up some logic to say, let's print i while i is less than 5. Otherwise, we're going to break this loop. So watch what happens here. Um, it actually goes 1, 2, 3, 4. When it gets to 5, you know, 5 is actually not less than 5. It is uh, equal to 5. So if we wanted to print a 5, we'd have to go less than or equals. And if we did that, we would get the 5. Now, I just showed you some examples of uh, using logic statements, and I'm going to continue moving forward because we will talk about logic statements in another lab. It's worth knowing there's other kinds of loops. So we've been focusing on for loops. Here's an example of a while loop. Here's an example of a repeat loop. I will leave it up to you to 
study those. I rarely use these kinds of loops. It's worth knowing that they're there. Okay. If you're going to do a one-liner, so we could do that right here, uh, we don't actually need the braces. So if all you want to do is, uh, for example, we're going to print I five times in this loop, we can put the, the meat of the loop on one line. All right, um, I just want to give you an example now of using a loop to do something, such as uh, systematically changing or assigning the contents of a variable. So let's say we had an empty vector called x. So there it is, it's got nothing in it. And let's say we wanted to create an x that had five ones in it. Well, we could use a loop to do that. We would say, let's make a loop that's going to go um, from 1 to 5. And now we know that i is going to change 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we could set it up. We've, we've learned that we can use square brackets to uh, locate individual positions of a vector. So this is like saying we've got a vector with five locations, or sorry, um, it will have five locations. I'm, I'm going to re erase this. We're saying that at the beginning here, x is basically nothing. At the first step of the loop, x at position 1, because remember, i will be 1, so we'll put a 1 in here. We're going to assign this a value of 1. So basically create a vector with a 1 position with a 1 in it. And then we're going to loop around, and I will become a 2, because the, that's the next thing in the loop. So then there will be a 2 into here. So now we'll be indexing into the second position of x. That is this position with nothing in there, but we'll assign a 1 into there. And then the next stage of the loop, I will become a 3. And then there will be a 3 going into here. So we'll be indexing into position 3. And then we'll assign a 1 into that. And we're going to keep doing that five times. And if we run this, we'll see that, indeed, there is now an x vector with five 1s in it. And uh, what's this? Is this one different? Oh, yeah. So we've if we just change this slightly, instead of putting a 1 into each of the positions, and we put i into each of those i positions, we're now going to put a 1 into position 1, a 2 into position 2, a 3 into position 3, and so on. So we will get something that looks like this, and x will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay. So just to remind you, and I think I'm going probably almost up to an hour here, generally I'm going to try to keep these closer to 45 minutes or half an hour, but the, the first one is taking you longer. Uh, sorry, we were interested in our third problem, writing a sum function in R. How do we do that? Well, we've learned about algorithms and loops, and let's use a loop to add up a bunch of numbers. So that's right here, using a loop to add up numbers in a vector. All right, we've got some numbers. We're going to put them in A. So now A has the numbers 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. What we want to do is create a variable to store the sum. And we're going to start it off at 0. So this one is called the underscore sum. It starts off at 0. And we want to go through to the numbers and add a 10 in and then add the 20 in, and then add the 30 in and we can do that just like just like here in this loop we're saying for i and a now a is the numbers 10 20 30 40 50 so we know that i will become 10 then 20 then 30 then 40 then 50. so what we're going to do is we're going to say well, 
let's now take the sum and add it to the value of i and put that back into our variable. So if we run all of this, we'll see that uh, indeed at the end of the loop, the sum has added up to 150, which is the sum the same as the correct answer. I'm going to try to write this out so that we can see what's happening at each step of the loop. We know there's five numbers. So in terms of cycles, there's one, two, three, four, five cycles of this loop. Um, and these correspond to the values uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50, which are in the variable A, right? Okay, so what will the value of I be on the first cycle of the loop? Well, that value will be the first number. That will be a 10. Okay, so what will the value of the sum be? Well, let, let's think about this. Before we do this, we decided it had a value of zero, right? So it has a zero in it. Uh, so right here at this point, this part is equal to zero plus i. Now the current value of i is a 10. So this whole highlighted blue part is 0 plus 10, and that's going to equal 10. Great. Now remember, we put that back in to the sum. Now on the second stage of the loop, we're on the second cycle. What is the value of i? Well, it becomes a 20. And how about this blue part? Well. From before, the sum is now being updated to be 10. So this is going to be 10 plus 20 because i is now a 20. So that's going to equal 30. And the 30 gets assigned back into the sum. And then the next step of the loop, i becomes uh, 30, which is the next item. So then it's going to be uh, 30 plus 30, which is the previous value of the sum. And that's going to equal 60, and that goes into the sum, and so on. So this becomes 40, and then it becomes 60 plus 40 equals 100, and then this becomes 50, and then you get 100 plus 50 equals 150. So that's a way of trying to break down what's going on in this loop. All right. So we used a for loop to add up some numbers in a vector. Now, the last thing we want to talk about is writing a function just like the sum function, just like this, but we'll make it our own. And that would allow us to add up numbers, um, any numbers, not just the numbers 10 to 50. So let's check how, how we would do that. Here's a general syntax for writing functions. We can assign a function into something like this, uh, which is the name, or sorry, we can give our name here. Sorry, let me back up. Here's where we name a function, and then here's what the code to define the function looks like. We use the word function. Inside of the parentheses, we put input parameters, and inside of the curly braces, we do some code. What This is going to usually do something based on the input parameters, and then we're going to output something, or in this case, we use the word return some value. So think about the sum function. We input some numbers, we add them up, and then we output the total sum. All right, I want to show you some quick example functions. 
just to get you thinking about how they work in R. One nice thing about uh, programming languages, you can define your own functions and then reuse them all the time. So this one's called print hello world. If we run that, we get another function appears in here. And let's take a look at what it's doing. Well, there's no inputs in here. There's nothing between the parentheses. That's okay, you don't need inputs. So every time we run this function, it's just going to do the thing inside the curly braces. In this, in this case, it says return uh, print hello world. So every time we run this function, it returns hello world. It prints out hello world. And just to remind you, when you run the function, if you don't put parentheses, it'll actually print out the description or the definition of the function. And you need to put parentheses at the end to run the function. Okay, here's a kind of silly function. What it does is it takes an input value and it returns the input value. It's like, um, imagine we had a pipe and this is going to be your function. We're going to put in a one and we're just going to let the one go through it and it's going to pop out a one. This is kind of stupid, but that's okay. We input something and return our input. So we've defined, we've given it the name return input. We've said, okay, our function has an input and it's actually we're calling this input. And then we're going to return whatever that is. So for example, return input, I'm going to put a seven there. Now what's happening is the variable inside the function called input, that's going to be assigned a seven, All right? Now when we get into here, uh, it's going to say, well, let's return whatever this is. And what is it? Well, it was assigned a seven. So it's going to return a seven. If we put an 11, it would return 11. Um, and yeah, if we did something like this, put in, put the string something into the variable a, and then we asked, uh, put the variable a into our return input function. It's just going to return the contents of a, which is something. Let's do something slightly more advanced. Uh, it's like this. But what we're going to do is we're going to put a number into our function and then we're going to add one to it so that when it comes out of the function, it will be one more than what went in. And so to do this, here we have our add one function. Let's take a look at it. Um, inside the function, we've got uh, one line where we take our input value that will be defined in here. And we add a one to it. And then we put that into a temporary variable called temp. And then we return temp instead of the input. Now temp has been modified from the input. It's been and we've added one to it. So if we do add one and then we put a one in here, we should get a two coming out. Or if we put a three, we'll get a four coming out. Notice if we did like an A, We'll get an error because it's going to try to add a one to this character that's an a and we get this argument that says non-numeric argument um, so often you will want to add some handling in your function to make sure people can't do that this is an example i'll just quickly uh, load this go through these examples in another time more closely. Here, when we add a one, we put in a number, it works properly. But when we uh, try to add an A, we it doesn't, we get an error, but and we also defined our own custom um, error message. Finally, a function can take numerous inputs. So here's one with three different inputs. The in first one's called input, the second one's called x underscore plus, the third one's called x underscore times. 
is we're gonna put in different numbers here. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, well, let's take this input plus X underscore plus, we'll add those together. Then we'll multiply that by this third variable, put all of that into temp and return it. Um, so if we did that, it'd be like saying, okay, we're gonna, our first input's gonna be a one, X plus is gonna be a two, X underscore times is gonna be a three. And we've defined this so that it's gonna go one plus two, we get a three there. And it's gonna, that value times three is a nine. So running this will give us a nine. All right. So the point of all of this was just to give you some verbal descriptions of, of going through these various basic R foundations. Uh, your assignment for the lab is to work on these uh, generalization problems. There's six of them here. I shall flip back over the website. This is pretty small, but we can look down. And um, yeah, to, on Thursday, when we meet for the first time, uh, we'll talk more about how to submit these things and get you set up to do that. Also for this lab, I'm going to go ahead and pretend I was a student and I'm going to uh, make another video that shows how to solve all of these problems and submit the assignment. You can go ahead and try to do this on your own um, and or you can follow along with my examples and uh, use that as help to submit this assignment. Okay, I'm going to stop for now. I'm going to uh, see you in class on Thursday. <laughs>